I'm Scott Aniel, and welcome to By the Waters of Babylon, a podcast dedicated to discussion of Christianity in a post-Christian culture. Recently, I put out a message on social media asking for requests for topics to cover on this podcast, and I'll be going through some of those topics that people posted in the weeks to come. One of those was the issue of elders and deacons. And so that is the subject of this podcast, to look at what the New Testament teaches about these two biblical offices for the church. But first, I'd like to ask a request of you. If you enjoy this podcast, it would be helpful if you do two things. Number one, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcasting service you typically use. This makes sure that the episodes download automatically for you and helps to increase the visibility of the podcast for others as well. And then second, share this podcast on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever social media services you use. It would be helpful if you share this podcast and let others know that you enjoy listening to it. There is a lot of debate, especially among Baptists, about the issue of church polity, how churches ought to be organized. Some debates within the church are unhelpful and harm the body of Christ, but this debate, I think, is one that is actually warranted and could help the body. And we are seeing in many Baptist churches leadership going back to the scriptures to discern how churches ought to be organized. This discussion is good because it helps churches recognize problems that have developed within their church organizational structures that need to be remedied. And these problems involve the biblical responsibilities given to pastors and deacons. I think many churches today, Baptist, non-denominational, Bible churches, evangelical churches, evidence at least one of three problems. The first problem in many churches is that the deacons of the church have assumed unbiblical leadership roles. In some churches, the deacons serve more as ruling executives than the model set forth in Scripture. Often deacon boards like this view themselves as the primary leaders of the church, often to the expense of the authority of the pastors. We've probably all heard of churches where the deacons insist upon having so much authority and power within the church that they eventually chase away every pastor they get. That's an extreme example, of course, but in many churches, the differences between the roles of the pastors and the deacons is very little. The second problem in many churches is really the opposite of the first. The pastor or pastors have the proper oversight and authority within the church, but the deacons of the church don't fulfill their biblical responsibilities. They may be simply a sounding board for the ideas of the pastors, or they may just be yes men, but they don't do what they are supposed to be doing as deacons. And then this often leads to the third problem. The third problem is that pastors are distracted from their biblical responsibilities because they are occupied with doing what the deacons are supposed to do. Now, sometimes this is the fault of deacons who neglect their responsibilities, but sometimes it is also the fault of pastors who involve themselves in matters that they shouldn't. So the pastors end up being very controlling, making every little issue of the church their business, And this causes them to neglect their biblical duties. And sometimes this gets to the point where a pastor is really a controlling dictator and even the congregation is not able to fulfill its God-given responsibilities. In order to remedy these problems, we need to understand what the New Testament teaches about the officers of the church. The New Testament uses four different titles for officers within the church. The first is the term deacon, and we see this term first appear in Acts chapter 6, which we'll look at in a moment. And then the other three titles are presbyteros, often translated elder, episkopos, often translated overseer or in the old King James bishop, and then the third term is poimain, which is the word shepherd or pastor. Now, the question, of course, with these three titles is whether they refer to different offices, as some churches teach, or whether they refer to the same office. And in order to answer that question, I'd like to take us to two different passages of Scripture. The first is in Acts chapter 20. This is toward the end of Paul's ministry, 
And in verse 17, Paul calls the elders of the church at Ephesus, the term there is presbyteros, he calls the elders of the church at Ephesus to come to him. And then notice what Paul says in verse 28. He's speaking to the elders of Ephesus and he says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Now notice that Paul admonishes these elders to take heed to the flock. That is a word that has the same root word as poimen, which is translated pastor or shepherd. So he's using that image to describe their role. And then where it says to care for the church of God, that word care is a form of the word poimen. So again, this is the sort of pastoral role of these elders of Ephesus. And then he says, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That's the word episkopos. So there is no doubt here that Paul considers the elders of the church in Ephesus to also be overseers and pastors. Those three terms describing different roles of one office within the church. One more passage is helpful on this point. 1 Peter chapter 5 Verse 1 says, So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. So Peter is exhorting elders. Again, that's the word presbyteros. And what is he exhorting elders to do? Verse 2 of 1 Peter 5, Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. So these elders are to shepherd, that's the word poimen, the flock of God, and they are to exercise oversight. There is the verb form of the word episkopos from which we get our term overseer. So what is clear from the New Testament usage of these three terms, then, is that they do not describe three separate offices within the church, with the deacon being the fourth office. This is not some sort of church hierarchy, as some denominations argue. But these terms describe two distinct offices. On the one hand are deacons, and on the other hand are the elders, who are also called overseers, and pastors. The term elder is the most commonly used title for this office. It denotes the spiritual wisdom and respect that these church leaders possess. Overseer and pastor describe more of the function of elders. Pastor especially is used most often in the New Testament as a verb rather than as a noun or a title. In our day, we tend to use the word pastor, especially in evangelical and especially Baptist churches, as the primary title. But really in the New Testament, elder is the more often used title. We probably have developed the use of the term pastor predominantly as an overreaction against traditions that see elder as something separate or some sort of hierarchical position above pastor. But really, elder is the most used title for this office. Pastor and overseer are more often used as verbs to describe the role of the elders within the church. So it's important to understand that according to the New Testament, there are two offices in the church, elders and deacons. So we've talked a little bit about elders What about deacons? Well, again, the first appearance of the term deacon is found in Acts chapter 6, where there arises problems with the new church. The church has been growing. By Acts chapter 6, we are now anywhere from three to five years after the church was born in Pentecost. We know from Acts chapter 4, verse 4, that the church was comprised of 5,000 men at that point, and we know that others came to Christ after that. So by this time in Acts chapter 6, including believing women, some estimate that the church in Jerusalem could have had as many as 20,000 members. 
That's a huge number of people, even for 12 apostles to lead. At this point in the life of the church, these apostles had two primary responsibilities toward the congregation. First, these apostles were the elders of this congregation. I mentioned earlier in reading 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter calls himself an elder. So they were apostles, but in these early years, they served as the elders of the church. They had not yet ordained other elders. That would come later when they spread out of Jerusalem. So the apostles were serving as elders, as pastors, as overseers of this new church in Jerusalem. And then the second responsibility of the apostles to the congregation was that they served the material needs of the church. They helped with the financial distribution to the members in need. In Acts chapter 4, we read that many people laid money at the apostles' feet. The apostles distributed it to the needy within the church. It's very likely that many of those Jews who had traveled to Jerusalem for Pentecost and had believed in Christ and been baptized remained in Jerusalem for some time so that they might be taught about Christ. They didn't go home because they needed the apostles' teaching, and they really had nothing to go home to. These were the Grecians, the Hellenistic Jews that are described in the book of Acts. They stayed in Jerusalem. They had to be housed and fed during this period as they were being taught the apostolic doctrine. And so this is why, as Acts chapter 4 tells us, some of the wealthy landowners among the new Christians sold a portion of what they owned to help to meet the needs of these homeless Christians. So these were huge responsibilities for these 12 apostles to carry out for a congregation of perhaps somewhere around fifteen to 20,000 members. Not to mention that they were also preaching the gospel to unbelievers and being arrested for it. And so it's no wonder that they began to neglect some of their responsibilities. They couldn't keep up with it all. And so some in the congregation began to feel neglected by the elders of the church, specifically the Greek-speaking Jews within the congregation who had remained in Jerusalem after Pentecost, complained that their widows were being overlooked in the financial distributions. But what could have become a significant problem in the church, what could have caused great disunity and division, was used by God to organize the structure of the church in a way that would best accomplish his purposes. And in handling of this situation, the apostles give us a very good picture right here in Acts chapter 6 of the proper roles of elders, of deacons, and then of the congregation as a whole. So first, the apostles reveal to us their primary responsibilities as elders of the church at Jerusalem. They say in verse 2, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now that Greek term translated serve in verse 2 is the verb form of which we get our English word deacon. The term simply means to serve. The apostles were saying that it would not be right for them as elders of the church to neglect the word of God in order to serve, to deacon, tables. Now, what were they talking about when they said serve tables? Well, the word tables refers to more than just serving food tables. And it's not referring to the serving of the Lord's table, which is sometimes what modern churches think. We, we assume that the deacons are the ones who are supposed to serve the Lord's table because that's what's mentioned in Acts chapter 6. No, in reality, the word here literally refers to banking, to tables of money. It refers to the kinds of administrative issues that would have naturally come with collecting and distributing money in the church. That's the context here. So what the apostles were saying was that it would not be right for them to be bogged down with the administrative matters of the church when it would cause them to neglect the word. Well, what did it mean when they said, leave the word? Did these apostles think that they were above serving the congregation? Well, no. These apostles were not against serving the church. They were simply insistent that God intended for elders to serve in a different way. This is clear in verse 4 when it says, 
but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the word translated ministry there in verse 4, interestingly, is also the Greek word from which we get our word deacon. So in other words, the apostles were not insisting that elders not serve the congregation. What they were saying was that it was not right for elders to serve the congregation in administrative matters when they should give themselves to serve the congregation, to literally deacon the congregation through prayer and the word of God. This gives us a lot of insight into the primary responsibilities of elders. Elders are to serve the congregation through prayer and the word. It's not right when that is neglected for other ministry, even good ministry. Pastors should give the great majority of their time and strength not to administration, not to financial matters, not even to distributing to the needy within the congregation, Elders should give the majority of their time to prayer and the word of God. It is through prayer and the teaching and preaching of God's word that elders primarily oversee and pastor the congregation. Unfortunately, this is often not the case in many churches today. Instead of being dedicated to prayer and the word, many pastors are little more than glorified administrators. Many elders micromanage the administrative details of the church to the point where they neglect their primary responsibilities. Elders are supposed to oversee the church. They are supposed to set the doctrinal and philosophical direction of the church. But when it comes to the everyday material administrative matters of the church, which are good and necessary things, elders must not get distracted. But does this mean that ministering to people's material needs within the congregation is unimportant? Certainly not. And the apostles' actions in this passage make that clear. Verse 2 of Acts 6 says, And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The apostles are insistent that elders must give themselves primarily to prayer and the word, but they don't view administrative matters as unimportant. They are important. In fact, everyday material administrative issues are spiritual matters. That's clearly evidenced in this text. What might have appeared to be a mundane administrative matter could have caused disunity and division in the body of Christ. Satan is using seemingly mundane administrative matters to cause dissension within the church. And that's why, while it may not seem that administrative issues are important, they are. They are spiritual matters. We often bemoan church business meetings and dealing with business and buildings and property and finances, and it's understandable why we would. We want to get to the important spiritual matters of worship and discipleship and evangelism. But make no mistake, the practical business matters of the church have spiritual significance, and so they must be overseen by qualified spiritual men. But while both have spiritual implications, there's a difference between administrative matters and priorities like worship, discipleship, and evangelism. And a problem arises, as it does in Acts chapter 6, when the administrative matters distract the elders of the church from their God-given ministry. So the solution to this problem, then, was to create a second office within the church to handle these administrative matters, the office of the deacon. The actual title for deacon is not found in this passage, but as we've already seen, the Greek term for deacon is found three times in its verb form, two of which describe this ministry in administrative matters. So this passage in Acts 6 gives us clear direction then as to what the primary responsibilities of deacons should be. Deacons should serve the material needs of the congregation. Deacons should oversee any administrative matters that would otherwise cause the elders to neglect their responsibilities. 
and the spiritual nature of what might seem to be simply mundane duties is further highlighted by the fact that the apostles insist that the men chosen to be deacons meet certain spiritual qualifications. These men had to be respected among the whole congregation as spiritual, wise men. And then, of course, Paul lists further qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3 right alongside spiritual qualifications of elders. They must exhibit spiritual qualifications because even administrative issues within the church are spiritual matters. Yet, unfortunately, just like many elders in our day neglect their responsibilities, so many deacons fail in their roles. Some deacons neglect their responsibilities out of a desire for more power. They want to rule the church. They want to be the church executives. And so they belittle the pastors and spread their influence only to the end of destroying the church. This is a great travesty, but it's unfortunately not uncommon in churches today. What is crystal clear from this account in Acts chapter 6 is that deacons are not supposed to be rulers of the church, Deacons are not leaders in the same sense as elders are. They're not like a second house of Congress. Deacons are servants. Nowhere in the New Testament are deacons given authority to rule over the congregation. Deacons were created to preserve the unity of the body by serving material needs within the church so that elders could give themselves over to prayer and the word. So what application then does this have for the body as the whole? What importance does this have for church members who may never actually be elders or deacons? Well, understanding the biblical roles of elders and deacons is important for us for at least three reasons. The first is found in Acts chapter 6. The apostles instructed the whole congregation in verse 3 to choose men to serve in the role of deacon. The apostles didn't just choose seven men and appoint them as deacons. They instructed the congregation to select seven men who exhibited certain spiritual qualifications. This was not a popularity contest based on earthly qualifications. The apostles instructed the congregation to choose seven men who exhibited honesty, submission to the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. This doesn't mean elders can't recommend deacons. Often elders have a more full understanding of the spiritual qualifications of church members, and often elders take note of church members who are already actually serving. And so it makes sense in the practical outworking of ministry for elders to recommend certain individuals for the congregation to affirm in the office of the deacon. And then notice that also once the congregation selected candidates— The elders were the ones to approve and appoint them. Again, because elders usually have more insight into the spiritual lives of members of the congregation, elders have the right and authority to veto a prospective candidate that they consider unqualified, perhaps due to matters they know but the whole congregation might not. But nevertheless, the congregation as a whole was given the responsibility of carefully evaluating the lives of those respected among them and choosing men to fill the office of deacon. It's important to recognize that although elders are to rule churches, the congregation as a whole has significant responsibilities in the governance of the church. Selecting deacons under the guidance of the elders is one such responsibility, but the New Testament prescribes other responsibilities for the entire congregation as well, such as exercising church discipline, We see this in 1 Corinthians 5 and 2 Corinthians 2, where the congregation as a whole has a role in church discipline. Also, 1 Timothy 3.15 says it is the responsibility of the church as a whole to protect biblical orthodoxy as the pillar and ground of the truth. And in Acts chapter 14, we see the congregation as a whole affirming the appointment of elders and even holding preachers accountable, as we see in Galatians 1.8. It's instructive that most of the New Testament epistles were sent to entire churches, not just the elders of the church. In the New Testament, churches are ruled by elders, served by deacons, and governed by the church as a whole. 
This is a wonderful God-ordained organizational structure to make sure that the work of the ministry is being done properly. What this means is that if elders are being distracted from prayer and the word by some other ministry or administrative issue, it is up to the congregation to make sure that it is remedied. This means that if the deacons of the church are power-hungry and are trying to rule the church, it is up to the congregation to make sure that is remedied. And this means that if some within the congregation are failing to live up to their responsibilities, it is up to the congregation to make sure that it is remedied. And so we have seen in the record of this event in Acts chapter 6 a clear picture of how the church should be organized. Elders serve the congregation by leading its theological and philosophical direction by prayer and the teaching and preaching of the word. Deacons serve the congregation by overseeing administrative matters within the church so that the elders are not distracted, and the congregation as a whole is responsible to make sure it is all happening properly. If the body of Christ is organized in this way, the church will flourish like this one did in Acts chapter 6, verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Thank you for listening to By the Waters of Babylon. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or other podcasting services, and if you enjoy the podcast, please give it a five-star rating. You can find me on Twitter at twitter.com slash scottannual. I blog at g3min.org. And for articles, audio, and speaking itinerary, visit scottannual.com. Join me next time as we discuss issues related to Christianity in a post-Christian culture. Mm-hmm.